Well, I've broken out the knockoff Kefta sweater, so you know what that means. <laughs> Hello, my friends. My name is AJ, and welcome or welcome back to my book nook. Today, we are going to be talking about the newest season of Shadow and Bone on Netflix, and I have a lot of thoughts. <laughs> this channel has a very special connection to Shadow and Bone, I feel like. Um, I was not aware of that book series until I found out that Love of My Life, Ben Barnes, was going to be playing a character in the TV adaptation of it, and then I decided to read the books and really enjoyed them. Some of the first videos on this channel are me talking about the book series as well as the first season of the show, so this really honestly feels like a very full circle especially considering that the second year anniversary of this channel is, well, it's either tomorrow or today, depending on when I release this video. I don't know when it's coming out. I wanted to wait a little bit before releasing a video on the second season, and it's been about two weeks now, so I feel that this is a good time to talk because this is going to be filled with spoilers. As a background, I really enjoyed the first season of Shadow and Bone. I thought that it stayed true enough to the books to really honor the original story but was different enough that it really thrived in the new format and changed up some things which made it even more interesting. Now the second season, <laughs> um, I have a lot of issues. <laughs> now Lee Bardugo, the creator of the book series, as well as the creator of the show, said to everyone that the show and the movie are different things. Like, don't think of them as an adaptation, it's completely separate. Which is not something you want to hear about an adaptation, but I digress. So a lot of you are probably watching this thinking, oh AJ, you can't complain about things that went wrong with the show because it's not true to the books. Because they said it was a different thing, you can't complain about it being different, and you're right. I can't, and I amped. Am not. Won't? Anyway, I actually liked a lot of the changes that they made for this show. I think the ending fit a lot better, but all of my issues with it are more so from a storytelling perspective. And everything that I'm gonna criticize today is exactly what I would criticize if this show was an original creation. So let's dive right into it. Number one, and I have seen other people say this as well, the pacing of this show is horrendous. Now this season fits in essentially four books in one season. This season we went through all of Siege and Storm, all of Ruin and Rising, the second half of Crooked Kingdom, as well as a few smaller aspects from Six of Crows. And you may be thinking to yourself, oh okay so did it move way too fast? Did they take out a bunch of stuff and it made it move too slow? Yes. The first four episodes of the season were so incredibly fast and the second half of the season was so incredibly slow. Episodes one through four moved way too fast for me. Uh, this covered all of Siege and Storm and basically the end of Crooked Kingdom, and I think it really was a detriment to the storytelling aspects. There are a lot of really emotional moments in Siege and Storm, as well as in Crooked Kingdom, that didn't hit as well as they did in the books in the show because we didn't have the chance to build up that emotional connection. We didn't have time to have suspense, there was no build-up, there was no foreshadowing, and it meant that a lot of these moments just did not land very well. Let me give you a few examples for that. The Darklings attack on the Little Palace, or in the show, on the Spinning Wheel. Now in Siege and Storm, a lot of people don't like that book, and honestly fair enough, because a lot of it is them preparing for the Darklings attack. It's them going to the Little Palace, Alina learning how to become a leader, and having to train Grisha, evacuate the children, creating these big giant dishes on the roof so that they can amplify the cut, and they think they're ready. They have a plan, they have weapons, they have training, they know that they have warning if the Darkling comes. And so when he arrives and attacks them, he gets the element of surprise because of a stupid mistake that Vasili makes. That creates this big sense of hopelessness because we've just spent an entire book building up, preparing for his attack. And just because he has the element of surprise, the battle's over like that. Create this sense of hopelessness and this sense of a real understanding of the power that he's been able to amass over the centuries that he's been alive. This doesn't land in the show because Alina arrives at the spinning wheel at maybe episode 
three, and then he attacks in episode four, an episode later. They've had no time to prepare. They've had no time to train. We really haven't seen them doing all that much planning. And so his attack doesn't have that same effect of showing us how hopeless it really is to fight against this man who's been preparing his whole life for this. Jenya's scarring. In the book, Jenya is left with the Darkling at the very beginning, helping Alina. And we don't know what happened to her. And then at the very end, when Alina confronts the Darkling, he brings her out and shows all this massive scarring. In the show, I actually like that they showed her trying to escape with David and they showed, you know, not the actual attack of the Nishavoya, but the face of David as he's hearing her screams. And I thought, oh great, they're building up this suspense, they're building up this anticipation, you don't know what she looks like, you don't actually see the attack. And I thought, okay, well maybe they're just gonna show maybe the back of her head, but they're never gonna show her actual face and we're gonna see it you know, at the end of the storyline for Siege and Storm. No, no, you see it way before Alina does and you see it very early on after it happens. Like the same episode or the very next episode. It's very quick. And because you don't have any of that anticipation or that buildup, it really doesn't create this suspense. It really doesn't create this worry for her that you get otherwise. And honestly, Episode four felt like a finale. If they had stretched that out to make the first four episodes the entire second season, I think it could have been really, really good. I think it could have been paced well. I think those emotional moments could have landed better. As for episodes five through eight, these episodes focus on ruin and rising. Oh my gosh, I was so bored. It just moves so, so slowly. There's a new story for the crows finding this blade that can cut through shadow. And I didn't mind that. I actually really like the inclusion of these new storylines for the crows. I think it lets us see a little bit more of them, which I think would have been nice for the first half of the season as well, as well as incorporating them into the shadow and bone storyline very nicely. So I don't have a lot of notes on that part. Uh, as for <laughs> The Shadow and Bone storyline, I have a couple of moments that really frustrate me. First off is the Firebird reveal. I just want to say, I have been waiting for the Firebird reveal since I read that scene. In the book, it's this beautiful moment where they have been walking and journeying for so long. They find this waterfall that when the light hits it as the sun setting, it looks like it's on fire. And Mal and Alina climb to the top to shoot down this bird. And then Alina falls and Mal catches her around the wrist and there's this burst of light. And I was just imagining how beautiful that scene could have been. Do you know what we got instead? We got Bagra the walking exposition machine. It was such a boring moment to have Bagra just tell Mal, oh yeah, you're Morozova's line. Okay, like you're the firebird. Like it was so boring. It did not have that emotional impact. Again, uh, you would think they slowed the pacing down. The emotional moments are gonna hit better. No, they they didn't. <laughs> Next, well, let's move on to my second big issue with this show, and that is Alina's character development. In the books, we get this really interesting story of Alina being so terrified of the Darkling and so terrified of what's gonna happen that she starts off in the second book running away, dealing with the guilt of having cut a skiff in half, leaving all these people, innocent people, in the middle of the fold to die. She's dealing with guilt, she's dealing with fear. We see her conquer that through the series. We see her fighting despite her fear. We see her becoming a leader. We see her struggle with the boundaries of power. We don't see any of that in the show. Alina is such a static character and that is no fault to Jessie Mae Lee. She is fantastic. I don't mind her being brave. I don't mind her being strong and powerful. That's fine. But if you leave no room for your characters to grow, it means that we're not going to get to see this development of them through the season. They're going to be static and they're going to be not interesting to follow. It's probably why a lot of people prefer the Six of Crows storyline because at least there we do get some character development as the season goes on. And what makes Alina so much more powerful in the Darkling, what makes her able to outstand him is that she has her friends. Her love and her weakness is what makes her strong, is what makes her able to fight back. And so changing that so that she's sort of standing on her own 
not the best choice in my opinion. We also don't really get these really interesting conversations that we see in the books that I think could have made the show a lot more complex. The questions of the limitations of power, of, of darkness and light. One of the great things about this book series, I think, is that it really subverts your expectations. You go into it thinking, oh, there's a light summoner and a shadow summoner. It's gonna be one of those stories where it's very clear cut. This is the good guy, this is the bad guy. And that's really not what the book series does at all. In fact, as Siege and Storm and Rune and Rising go on, Alina begins to see that it's not so clear. Because as she gets a second amplifier, which she is warned against by many people because what is infinite? The universe and the greed of men. We don't see that at all. In fact, Bagra and Mal, the two biggest people who are against her becoming more powerful in the books, are some of her biggest encouragers in the show. And it really doesn't make any sense to me that no one is questioning this whatsoever. But as Alina gets more powerful, she starts doing things to get people to follow her that are morally questionable. And definitely not to the level of the Darkling's actions, but definitely to a level where she's not so goody-goody anymore. And she sees that it's not so clear cut. And we begin to see that there are parts of the Darkling that she finds in her friends, like Bagra's belief that power is more important than love, or Hardshaw, who isn't even included, in this show who is willing to set a town on fire just because they're persecuting Grisha. Or David, who has this same curiosity that Morozova did that led him down this dark path. And even Alina begins to take on some of the Darkling's powers after her bonding with him at, at the end of Siege and Storm. And that is quite a literal show that the more power she gets, the closer she is to becoming like him. And the thing that's keeping her from becoming like him is the fact that she still has her friends. She hasn't faced loss and the grief that he has. And I think that that would have been a very interesting commentary because this show does seem very set on making us have empathy and sympathize for the Darkling, but they refuse to show us how the good guys could possibly become like him one day. Speaking of the Darkling, another one of my big issues is that I felt this season did not make the Darkling as intimidating as a, of a villain. In the books, it is so hopeless when he attacks because they've been planning Nothing can happen. He blinds Bagra, he kills her teachers, and he threatens to bring a bunch of children into the fold. She believes that he will do that because he has shown her that he is cruel and she has, as in his word, made him the villain. In the books, there's also this connection between the Darkling and Alina uh, through Siege and Storm and also through Ruin and Rising a bit where they are connected and they can talk to each other. And we do see a bit of that in the show, but with the Siege and Storm, Alina doesn't know how to go to him. He knows how to go to her and he will continuously sort of show up, just sort of staring at her. Or there's a moment when she's in the chapel with Mal and he's at the back. And then as they walk past, he just sort of like, shh, like he doesn't know I'm here. Like only you can see me. And that creates this sense of dread because you never know when he's watching. You don't know if she's losing her mind or if he's actually there or what he can see and hear and if he's spying on them. You have no idea. And I feel like that could have made him a lot more intimidating. Now, I will say there is one moment of him exploiting that connection, which I'm pretty glad that they removed because the consent in that scene is a little bit, <laughs> But other than that, I think it could have been really cool if they had removed that and then kept the rest of him just sort of taunting her by showing up. They were very obsessed with bringing humanity to this character, which again is not an issue, I understand. And honestly, Ben Barnes, mwah, love that man. He brings so much humanity to this character. You can really tell that he loves this character, that he understands this character, that he wants to see the good that is buried deep inside him. I think that they spent more effort in trying to make him human, that they removed his intimidating villain nature. I think they could have made him more human by showing, again, the features of him that are in Alina's friends. And then you see those similarities and you're like, oh yeah, they could easily become like him. Okay, it's time to talk about the finale because I have mixed feelings about it. First off, I wanna say the finale is very clearly an ad for a spinoff or a season three because half, they're done the last book within like the first 
20 minutes of the episode. And I remember watching the episode. The Darkling is dead, and I'm like, we still have 50 minutes left. Like, what are we gonna do for 50 minutes? Like, the storyline's concluded. It's over. There's so many plot lines that are set up that we may never get to even see, depending on if it gets renewed. And again, I liked a lot of the changes. I, I really... If you've watched my video on the Shadow and Bone book series, one of my biggest complaints is Alina losing her powers and ending up in a relationship with Mal. Because Alina has hated having powers. She wants to be like everyone else. She doesn't want to stand out. And I thought, wouldn't it be interesting if this was not a romance, but a story of self-love? Instead of losing her powers, Alina keeps her powers and she learns to love herself. She ends up with nobody. And that kind of happened. Mal did go off on a boat and become Stormhawn, which I'm cool with. And Alina did stay at the castle. I'm not a fan of the fact that she was engaged to Nikolai because I think that that is another thing that undercuts her. No longer is she the leader of the second army because she's powerful, it's because she's married to a man. Which I think, again, this show has a problem with making Alina have more agency and less agency at the same time, and I've talked about it before. But other than that, I really liked the changes that they made. I love the focus on sort of the friendship between Nina and Zoya and Alina and Genya, sort of that like the Grisha friendships that we get there and like the three Grisha women staying and, and forming a triumvirate. And also we do get a little bit of an intro of Nikolai having the Nisha Voya inside him. However, my one complaint we had no setup for any of this. Up until this point, we really haven't seen much of a friendship between Genya and Zoya, or Zoya and Alina. Nikolai never got attacked and turned into Anisha Voya, so we didn't have that buildup for him having it inside him, which I think could have been a really interesting thing to see. Is Mal and Alina, it makes sense for him to leave in the books, I think, because he clearly resents the fact that she's so powerful and he likes the version of her that's in his head, the version from Karamzin who doesn't have any power. But in the show, they change that as well. He's a lot more supportive of her and honestly, the relationship's a lot more healthy. And up until that point in the show, they've really been building up their relationship together. And I was like, okay, well, they're clearly gonna stay together. So they're trying to make him a little bit more likable. No, like I think it would have made more sense to show that their relationship would never work with them at the little palace and with her with her powers. I think it would have been a better setup, but it comes out of the blue that he leaves because up until this point, they've just been hunky-dory in their relationship, so it doesn't really make sense to me. And then of course, at the very end, in the very last few seconds, we see Alina use the cut against the woman who's been taking the Jirda Parem in setup for the Six of Crows storyline. We see her kind of have this sort of malicious smile start on her face. And I was like, oh, are we seeing that maybe she's starting to have a corruption of power? Like the power starting to make her power hungry? Why didn't we see that earlier? <laughs> As I said, a lot of the changes I don't mind. I think that they work really well. It's just they had no setup for it whatsoever. And that was a strange choice. I've been crapping on this show for a while now. So let me tell you a little bit about what I liked about this season. First off, the new cast killed it. Oh my gosh, Patrick Gibson, marry me. <laughs> yeah, Nikolai, Tolia, Tamar, all fantastic. Jack Wolf, you are Wyland Van Eck. I, I don't even know what else to say to you. I got to see a lot of the characters who didn't have a big role in the previous season really get to shine. Nina, Danielle really fit that character into the rest of the Crows dynamic really, really well. I thought she was such a scene stealer when they were all together. David and Jenya, they both have my heart. They were both fantastic. It was so great to see them have so many more scenes together and also independently. I thought they both captured the characters really well. And just a couple of more highlight moments that really did it for me. Kaz with the face off with Pekka Rollins. Freddie Carter, oh my gosh, sir. That scene was amazing. It was so intense. I absolutely loved it. It was phenomenal. Bagra's death with the Darkling. Ben Barnes, I know I just said Patrick Gibson marry me, but Ben Barnes, you have my entire heart. It's very simple. Ben Barnes starts crying in a role. I will also start crying. It happened with Westworld. It happened now. What can I say? That scene, 
Oh my gosh, it was so, so great to see this very human side of the Darkling and see him break down and being like, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't mean for this to happen. Oh my gosh, that was intense. It was fantastic. And then one other scene that didn't hit as hard, but I really, really enjoyed was Alina and Bagra's conversation about Alina's growing power and her relationship with the Darkling. I love that scene. That scene to me felt so important of giving Alina this moment of it's not your fault he used you and you are not him and I think they have it posted on their Instagram if you want to go watch it it's it's just it's great and I loved it and I thought it was very important to include so what are my final thoughts this season had massive major issues I still enjoyed it I want to make that very clear the first four episodes definitely infuriated me as I was watching them to the point where I had to take a several day long break before I could finish the rest of the show but the last four episodes were not as bad. I do think the show could have been better. You know, a lot of the emotional moments just didn't land. A lot of characters were just very static. And I would have given this criticism whether it was based on books or original. You know, pacing and emotional moments and character development are something that apply no matter what. I am a massive advocate of making changes to fit to the medium because novels are very different to TV and the way you tell an effective story is very different. However, if you're going to make an adaptation, you should at least try and keep the same themes and meanings and really keep the emotional moments strong. And I feel that this show just failed to do so. I think it would have been better if they had spread it out, made Siege and Storm this season and then Ruin and Rising next season. I actually do have a theory about that, as I mentioned, and I do want to say I think that they were either told by Netflix that they'd only be getting two seasons and so they were like, okay, we gotta fit it all in, or they thought they might only get two seasons because Netflix has a habit of canceling very popular shows if it's not Stranger Things or you after only two seasons. So I think that they probably either were told or they highly suspected they'd only get two and they thought they should push everything in as fast as they could. But overall, I thought the cast was fantastic I just think that the adaptation, the writing, the storytelling could have used a little bit of work. But that's it for me today. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, feel free to give it a thumbs up and go ahead and hit that subscribe button if you want to be notified when my next video comes out. And let me know in the comments, did you like season two? Did you have the same issues as I did? What were your favorite moments from the show? Who were standout performers to you? Let me know. I would love to have a conversation with all of you. But that's it for me today. I hope you enjoyed and I will see all of you lovely people in the next video. Bye.